Okay. What's that? Just like you? Okay. <laughs> Whew. Well, for what it's worth, I'm out of breath. Okay. All right. Good evening. Oh, man. I, uh, oh, okay. I'm all right. I'm okay. I might need some help. <laughs> Whew, I need a remote or something for that thing. Okay. All right, so let's continue our study. We're talking about biblical leadership, and we're still working our way through kind of defining that. We're adding uh, tenets to it, principles, ideas, learning from Jesus. That's what we did last week. And we're going to take those lessons from this month, and we're going to apply them to several characters. There's a list in the back if you want to kind of see our outline for the remainder of the school year. Um, because it's not going to be very long before summer series will be here, and we'll wrap this up and, and start a new new series. So I want to kind of just briefly recap. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this, um, but there are two key tenets to biblical leadership that we began with. That's how we started this um, series of lessons. Anybody remember what those were? Good job. Y you get the gold star this time. Yes. <laughs> Your smiley face, okay, I don't have any, but you can pretend. <laughs> so as a, as a side note, as we're thinking through this, both of these go under this umbrella of leadership. Um, there's not really, a, there is a, a leader in, in this story, but then there's this, this principle or this umbrella of leadership, a leadership model, if you will, and, and that's what we've been kind of talking about, and it involves what we just said, submission and authority. And, and so we're going to talk about that. We're going to look at it a little bit more. Last week, we talked about Jesus, and he set the example for us of what it looks like to truly be a leader. Now, one other thing we need to talk about, who determines who leaders are? Where does that authority come from? God. That's right. So God is the one who makes that determination that there will be a leadership model, that there will be a government, that there will be, um, within the church, there will be leadership. God is the one that makes that determination. It's always been that way. Um, and we also talked briefly about the fact that even though God built the system of government, what generally happens? Who puts people in the place that God has created? In, in our country, who does that? We do, right? So, so as the country goes, right, as the morals of a country go, do you think a leadership or a leader of a country will be morally leaning towards God or against God? When, when morals decline, let's put it that way, what generally happens to the leadership of the country? Yeah, that's right. That's a great example. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's right. So as, as a worldly model, we look at governments, we look at places like that. We know that God has established the overall umbrella of government, but we also know that ultimately the people kind of decide who's going to fill that role. And a lot of times as a, as a society declines in their morals, they have a tendency to put people in power that are like them or want to be like them, that kind of an idea. And we've seen that. So it's, it's almost inevitable that it's going to be a broken system, right? I mean, we've seen it throughout history, biblical history, world history. Um, ultimately, it doesn't always end the way we would like it to. So when Jesus comes on the scene as a king... And as a leader, he is going to completely turn all of that on its head. He changes everything. And so there are three more tenets to leadership that we learned last week. And you get extra, extra brownie points for this one, if you can remember those three. Anybody know what they were? What did Jesus teach us about being a leader? What's that? You weren't here. Well, man, you'd really get it. <laughs> if you knew the answer to that, you'd be awesome. Okay. 
All right, so the first one would be humility, right? That Jesus was a humble king, a humble servant of God, right? Even though he had power, he had authority, he had um, his, his father on his side, Jesus was humble. So humility is a, is a major lesson that we learned from Jesus. What else did we learn from Jesus about being a servant? What are the things that Jesus do? He served, yeah. By definition, he served. He, servanthood was one of the keys of his leadership model. Servanthood. In fact, he even says that in Luke's uh, writings that, you know, he, he came to serve. You know, he came to be a leader, he says, but he also came to serve. That servanthood is a major part of his leadership role. There's one more. Libby's got this one. I'm putting you on the spot because, you know, yeah, you got it. You got it. You even mentioned it last week. What thing did Jesus teach his disciples that sets them apart from everybody else that changes the leadership model entirely? It starts with an L. It goes like this. Love. <laughs> you got it. Perfect. It's Love. Yes. <laughs> throwing out hints, you know, just, you know, you know, L-O-V-E. <laughs> Love. So the three new lessons that we learned from Jesus, we learned from just our general study that authority and submission are the model, the foundational model. And then from Jesus, we learned that being a godly leader, um, a, somebody who's put in a position of leadership by God, it requires humility, servanthood, and love. Um, do we see that in worldly leadership? Unfortunately, we don't. Sure would be nice if we did, <laughs> you know. Um, boy, what great characteristics those are. But that's how Jesus led. In fact, Jesus went so far as to say that if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, what do you have to do? You had to take your cross, follow him. What was the... You had to become a what? A child, a servant, a child. You, you had to lower your status down to the level of a child? And then God can use you and exalt you into his leadership roles. And so those are some of the things that Jesus taught his disciples. Were Jesus' disciples really good at that at the very beginning? Not at all. I mean, they were constantly asking Jesus, Jesus, which one of us is going to be the greatest in the kingdom? You know, even, you know, we didn't read about the, the mother, but you remember mom comes along and says, hey, which one of my boys is going to sit on your right and your left, Jesus? You know, there's this constant, constant asking, who's going to be in charge? They're arguing with each other. Who's going to be the greatest? And Jesus has to continuously tell them, you are going to be leaders, but before I can put you in charge of my sheep, my people, you all are going to have to be humble leaders. And that's going to take some work. Um, that's going to take some time, and Jesus teaches them to do that. Okay, so we're going to be looking at Paul I was really tossing this idea around because Paul has so much to say about authority and submission. We can talk about the government. We can talk about families. We can talk about the church, all these different things. I really just want to look at Paul's own character, okay? I think that would be good, just to look at Paul, talk about how he exercised his role as a leader. Uh, and before we do, I just want to remind you that Paul wasn't always called Paul was he? What, what was he called? And when he was Saul, was he a servant, a humble servant, loving leader? No. What was he? Persecutor and a murderer, right? I mean, Saul was, was not the model of leadership, but was he considered a leader amongst the Jews? Absolutely. Pharisee of Pharisees. I mean, people looked up to Paul, so in that group, he was looked at as a leader, but he did not display godly leadership qualities. And so we're, what we see here is, is the humbled Saul, who then becomes who? Paul. It ne necessitates a name change, right? Because he's so different. Um, and we're going to learn about his leadership. So Ephesians chapter 3 is where I want us to go. Uh, this evening and kind of spend a little time in Ephesians. We're going to jump around a little bit, but not too much. Um, I don't like to jump around too terribly much if I don't have to. 
Ephesians chapter 3, this is going to be in verse 1 and 3. Paul is talking about his, his leadership. Ephesians 3. And it says, uh, <clears throat> Paul says, For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of the Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you. So Paul, when he writes this, is literally in prison, okay? And, and so that's, that seems to be the idea. Um, I was kind of thinking about how that would even feel or look. You know, what if, what if somebody came to the church? This is an example. What if somebody came to the church and they said, well, we would like to talk to, to, to y'all's leaders. I mean, who, who's in charge? Who's your leader? And we look at them and say, well, they're all in prison. <laughs> you know, what do you think they would think of us? Yeah, I mean, not highly, I would assume, right? I mean, that, that's not always a great first impression. You know, all the elders are in prison. I'm sorry, but, you know, you can go visit them, and they'd be happy to talk to you. Write them a letter. They'll write you back. Um, but that's where Paul was, and he was the leader of, of these churches. In fact, he held a high position of leadership among all the churches, not just one. All the churches. He was one of the apostles. He was the Apostle Paul, uniquely set in place to serve the Gentiles. As a Jew, that, that's a strong statement of his faith. And, and here he is, he's in prison, but he's, he's saying to the brethren that he's the prisoner of who? Yeah, he doesn't say, I'm the prisoner of Caesar. <laughs> I'm the prisoner of Rome. Why, why would he not say that? Why would, he, why would he not even think to declare that? I mean, why, why was he emphasizing himself being a prisoner of Jesus? What do you think? The one he serves, right. Do you think that if Jesus needed Paul out of prison, that Paul would be out of prison? Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about that. It's not the first time that's happened, right? Um, if Jesus needed Paul out of prison, he would be out of prison. So Paul sees himself in prison because Jesus wants him there, Right? Because if Jesus didn't want him there, he certainly wouldn't be there. And so in his mind, his imprisonment um, is probably a, a two ways to look at that. For one, his imprisonment is, is because of Jesus. His imprisonment is because he preached Jesus. Um, that kind of an idea. So that's the basic principle of his leadership role, is he is in a very humbled state, and yet he still is serving uh, with great passion for the church. Um, stewardship, he uses that, that word. You're, you're, anybody else have another word instead of stewardship? Anything else? What's that? No, everybody's stewardship? Okay, good. All right, all right, we're on track then. So the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you. So the giving of God's grace, and, and the way I read this is that Paul is a recipient of God's grace, okay? And, and when you see somebody being a recipient of God's grace, it carries a very heavy responsibility, okay? So, so the giving of God's grace always comes with responsibility, right? The privilege implies a purpose. And that's how Paul sees himself. He's a recipient of God's grace. Because of that, he has a mission. He has a work. He has a responsibility to, to live up to that. Um, because he has received God's grace, he has a work to do. And, and Paul will talk more about that in just a minute. But I wanted to look at Acts chapter 9 real quick. You can turn there. You don't have to turn there. I'm only going to read a couple of verses, and then we'll come back to, to um, Ephesians. But in Acts chapter 9, Paul says this in verse 15. But the, or excuse me, not Paul. Um, the Lord speaking the recorded words of Luke. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, talking about Paul, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So this is that period of time, of course, in Acts chapter 9 where... Saul becomes Paul. He's, he's humbled on the road to Damascus. He's blinded, and he's um, you know, baptized. 
and he's you know, able to see and go out on his mission, not as Saul anymore, but now as Paul. And his mission is going to dramatically change. He's going to go from a persecutor of the church to a, an apostle of Christ. And so that's his transition. Um, but Jesus took this man, okay, high position in the Jewish family, <laughs> high position amongst the Jews. He's on a mission, right? He, he's determined to, to snuff out Christians the way drag them out of their homes, put them in prison, whatever he needed to do to stop this movement from happening. And God chose that particular individual as somebody who will serve his purpose. And he takes Paul and he humbles him. And, and he humbles him by literally blinding him. And, and he has this vision of Jesus. He sees Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he has to be led <laughs> You know, he can no longer lead the people like he once was. I'm sure the people who were with him, he was the, the leader of that little group, you know. And now they have to actually lead him um, to, to Ananias so that he can hear more about what's going on with him. And basically, the, the scales fall off of his eyes as Jesus allows him to see. And um, I think that's very symbolic, <laughs> of the changing of his heart. And he was very blind to Jesus before, now he can see. And, and then he's baptized into Christ. And when he comes up out of the water, he, he has a period of time where he doesn't go, but then he goes and uh, does great work for the Lord. And so that's how we, we see Paul. That's his character. That's, that's where it all begins. So go back to Ephesians, if you will. So that's, that's the idea. Jesus has basically said, this man, <laughs> this unlikely character in history, this person who is a persecutor of Christians, he's the one that I'm going to choose to be, to, for one, to be a recipient of my grace um, in two different ways, for salvation and for ministry to the Gentiles. Um, but he will be a great worker for me. And he, he's going to suffer He's going to suffer a lot, but, but he's going to willingly participate. He's going to willingly suffer for my sake. And so look at verse 7 of Ephesians chapter 3. Paul says this, of which I was made a minister. <laughs> it is kind of an interesting phrase. When you think about, you know, people who work in ministry or people who work like Benny and, and his wife and those who work in Greece and, you know, Brad and, and his wife, you know, in a lot of cases, we can kind of see a point in time where they kind of chose that ministry. And they said, you know, we, we want to get into ministry. We think this would be good for us to get into ministry. Did Paul really have a choice? What do you think? I mean, maybe there was a point in time where he had to make a decision. But, I mean, it was pretty dramatic, you know. God chose him. I mean, he picked him out of all, out of all the other people to be his minister. But yet Paul is saying here, which I was made a minister. <laughs> and if you knew Paul's story, you would know that's, that's almost comical to think about how that all came about. According to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me, according to the working of his power, to me, verse 8, the very least of all the saints. So he became very great among the Jews, to being considered, considering himself the least amongst the brethren, amongst the, the saints. This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring the light what is the uh, administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. Um, so not only does Paul feel a sense of responsibility towards God because He's received grace, right? I mean, he's obviously received God's grace, but he even considers his min ministry to the Gentiles as grace, as a gift. So, so he's received grace, he's been saved, you know, he, he's grateful for that. He feels like he has a great responsibility to God for, for rescuing him from the path that he was on, from his ignorance. But now he sees the ministry to the Gentiles, not as a burden, you know, not, not as something that is, um, 
is going to, to be, be something he does begrudgingly, right? You know, we don't see that in Paul. We don't see Paul saying, oh, great, more Gentiles, here I go. You know, how I can't believe I have to do this again. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't do that, right? He's not a Jonah, right? He's not running from the responsibility. But he is, he is seeing it as a gift. That's what that word grace means. It's, it's the word charis in, in Greek, and it literally means charity. It literally means gift. And he's saying that my ministry to the Gentiles is a gift from God. It's a gift from God. And, and those of us who, who have received God's grit, grace, and just kind of make it more personal here for a minute, because we're talking about Paul, it doesn't mean that we cannot glean from it wisdom for ourselves. If you are a recipient of God's grace, if you're a recipient of God's grace, you have a responsibility to that. You do, right? You owe God everything. He rescued you. He saved you from certain death. He saved you from the path of destruction you were on. And if you're a recipient of that, wouldn't you think that you have a great responsibility to God to, to live the purpose of that? Why did God save you? Why did he rescue you? Why are you part of his family? Because God has a purpose for you in his family, right? And that's how Paul sees it. And I think we need to see it that way too. Um, it was an old story. I don't even know where it came from. It was a preacher story, so who knows whether it's true or not. Um, but there was an old story years ago about, uh, about a man, doctor, and uh, he, he was somewhere over, overseas. I think it was in Africa, a small little village, if I remember the story correctly. And uh, he, this man was brought in near death. He rescued the man, right? Saved his life. Uh, he um, um, sent him away well. And a few weeks later, the man comes back, and he has... Tons of people with him, animals with him, you know, kids and, and relatives, and they're all coming. And, and uh, he sees the man coming, and he says, well, what's this all about? And he goes, well, you know, in, in my culture, <laughs> the, when, when somebody rescues you or saves your life, you give everything to them. And so we're here to serve you. That's what we're here for. Yeah, they were moving in. I don't know if he liked that all that much. I mean, that would be kind of weird, but that's how it worked for them. Because they recognize that if somebody saves your life, that you owe that person everything. And that's how Paul is seeing his experience. God rescued him. And he now owes God everything. He has a responsibility. And his responsibility is to minister to the Gentiles. In Philemon, Paul says this. Uh, if you haven't read Philemon recently, you should. It's short, but it's powerful. Uh, Philemon, in verse 8, he says, Therefore, though I have enough confidence, remember Onesimus, the, the disobedient slave who runs off, you know, and Paul sees him and brings him in, teaches him the gospel and baptizes him, and he's going to send him back. Um, in verse 8, he says, Therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, Yet for love's sake, I would rather appeal to you since I am such a person as Paul the aged and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. So no one in the church <laughs> at this time had, had greater authority than the apostles. These were the men who had the authority. They were given this authority by Jesus himself. They had a great responsibility to serve the church, gifted with all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be able to effectively serve the church in this first century. And nobody had more authority in the church than these apostles. And here's Paul, who certainly had authority, right? But, but he doesn't lead from that position of, of authority. He doesn't lead from the ivory tower. He doesn't lead from the office in the back room, you know, that we kind of understand managers kind of doing that. But he leads from a position of love and humility. I mean, look what he says. You know, he says, I have enough confidence. I can just, I can order you to take this man back as your brother, right? I mean, that, that was the question. Will you take the slave that ran away back as a brother? And he said, I could order you to do it, but I'm not going to do that. 
What I would rather do is make an appeal, right, for, for love's sake, that you receive this man back as a brother, right? And that's an amazing statement because it is a powerful testimony to the kind of leadership God wants in his church. All right, back to Ephesians chapter 4, or we're going to go to chapter 4, rather. We're done with chapter 3. So Ephesians chapter 4, if you want to go ahead and turn there. In this chapter, uh, Paul has spent some time talking about the unity of the church. Um, He's talked about the fact that we, in chapter 2, really, all the way back to chapter 2, how he, that is God, has reconciled and brought together in one body the Jews and the Gentiles by the blood of Jesus. That's, that's chapter 2. He makes this appeal in chapter 3, encouraging them there. We just talked about that, about his ministry. And then in chapter 4, he, he zeroes in on the worthy calling of unity. What does it look like? What does it mean? It's such a worthy calling, being united as the body of Christ, um, And now he's going to be talking about things of that body, people in that body, and how they function. Because under this leadership umbrella, (laughs) whether it's authority, whether it's submission, wherever we we sit in in that position, we are all united in Jesus, right? Whether it's the person with the highest authority, even the Apostle Paul, he was still united with the body of Christ. They were all equals in Jesus. Nobody was pining for authority. Nobody was trying to be greater than another person. In fact, Paul sees his position as a very humbling position with with a ton of responsibility. And so that's how it works with with the body of Christ. There is equal, equal, um, equalness, it's not really a great word, but it works, for the people of of the body But then in the same hand, there are people who hold positions of authority, and and he's going to talk about that. Uh, In fact, Paul calls the giving of leadership in the church a gift. He uses that word again. He calls the giving of leadership in the church a gift from Jesus to the church. So let's look at what he says here in verse 7. He says, "...put to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift." Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 7. Therefore, it says, this is a quote from Psalm 68, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives and and gave gifts to men. It's a quotation of God um, basically running up Mount Zion victorious, that kind of uh, imagery. And then in verse 9, he says this, now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean? Except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth. Now think about Jesus humbling himself and becoming man. He who descended is himself also he who ascended. He could also, some people think he might be referencing the the burial of Jesus. I don't know which would be more accurate, maybe both. Either way, Jesus has descended and then he has now ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. So Jesus has humbled himself so that God can exalt him to a position of authority that's far above anything we can really imagine. All the heavens and the earth are under his, his power. In verse 11, this is what the exalted Jesus did, okay, with his authority. He gave, he gifted, he gifted the church. He says some apostles and some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Okay? We've heard these passages before. But the idea is that we have these apostles and prophets, right? They are permanent fixtures in the church. How is that true? How are the apostles and the prophets permanent fixtures in the church? How will they always be there to lead us? You're, I'm sorry? You're holding it right in your hand. The Bible, yeah, the, that's what we have from them. They will always be permanent leaders in the church because we can open our Bibles and read about Paul, read about Peter. We can read about James. We can read about Jude. We can read about John, right? And so we, we can read about these people. They will always be permanent fixtures in the church. 
uh, as the ultimate revelation of God's word. And then we have this word evangelist. Um, the word really means the bringer of good news. Okay, so these were people who would go out and and they would take what the apostles and the prophets taught, and they weren't inspired necessarily, but they would take what the the apostles and the prophets taught, and they would go and teach it, and they would proclaim the good news of Jesus. And then there's this other one. In the Greek, it is actually a single definite article, so it's really just one one person, or group of people rather, instead of two, which is your Bible tends to separate it. So pastors and teachers should really be translated teaching pastors. And the word pastor simply means what? What does that mean? What other English word do we use for that? I'm sorry? Elder or shepherd, overseer? Yeah, it's a shepherd. It literally means shepherd. Okay, it's a Greek word that means shepherd. And so shepherds who teach, that's basically what he's saying there. Um, and we call them elders, right? And so these are people who have received God's grace, right? They're recipients of God's grace. They have been given by Jesus a leadership role in the church. And it is considered by Paul a gift to the church, a gift to the church. Um, now, obviously, they don't want to act like they're God's gift to the church. I mean, that's not the point. There's some humility involved in there, folks. But the idea is that God, Jesus, having been exalted, felt that the church needed some leadership. And he chose this model for the leadership model. And so he sent his apostles. He sent his prophets. He sent his evangelists. He sent his, his elders. He called these group of people to lead the church effectively and do the work that he will do through them as they minister to the people. Um, look at verse 12. Here's kind of the reason, okay? Um, so we, we know that that's how Jesus modeled his church. And, and there's a reason for it. There's a good reason for it. The church needs something, right? The church has something that they need. They need leadership. In verse 12, it says, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all obtain the unity of the faith the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness and deceitful scheming. So the church needs leadership just like a ship needs a captain, um, just like a ship needs a navigator, the church needs some people within it that are going to be called by Jesus to serve in a position of humble leadership so that the church can avoid some of the pitfalls that are going to be waiting for them. Real quick, Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Now, then again, we don't know who the Hebrew writer is. Um, a lot of people guess it's probably Paul, but we just don't know. And we're just going to kind of act like it's Paul for this lesson uh, because I think it's very Pauline in nature. But Hebrews chapter 13, verses 7 and 9, I want you to, to listen to the Hebrew writer as he talks about this. And he's going to talk about it from a different angle. He's not going to talk about it as, okay, here's what Jesus did. He's not going to talk about it by saying, okay, leaders, step up. But he's going to talk about it from the submission level. He's going to say, okay, the rest of y'all, all of y'all need to respect and honor the leadership that Jesus has put in place. Look at verse 7. He says, remember those who lead you, who spoke the word of God to you, and consider the result of their conduct. Imitate their faith. That tells us what kind of people they ought to be, right? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be carried away by by varied and strange teachings. So this is more of an imperative. It's kind of, you know, before it was directed at kind of the model itself, saying, okay, here, here's what Jesus did, and here's the purpose of that, here's the reason he did it, so that the hope is we would all grow up and mature through their teaching, through their leadership. Now we're coming from the other angle, and, and the Hebrew writer is saying, okay, look at your leaders. 
Look at your leaders. You need to respect them. You need to follow them. You need to imitate them so that you are not carried away. So it's very personal to the submission side. Don't be carried away by varied and strange doctrine. For it is good for your heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods through which those who were so occupied would not benefit. Now, that last phrase would require you to pretty much read the whole book of Hebrews, but uh, we'll just let that one slide for now. Look at verse 17, same chapter, Hebrews 13, verse 17. Listen to these words. Obey your leaders. Do you hear that? That's what the Hebrew writer is saying to the, to the people. Obey your leaders. Submit to them. Why? <laughs> I mean, somebody might ask that question. I mean, what? Why do we want to obey the leaders? Why do we want to submit to them? Well, for one, he says, for they keep watch over your what? So that those who will, as those who will give an account. In other words, it's kind of like saying, okay, listen, okay, this, here's the deal. I know this is not the norm, <laughs> and I know that, that a lot of times worldly leaders do really bad things. We understand that, Okay. But as for the church, the church has a God-given leadership model. And your responsibility is to submit to those people because they have a responsibility, right? You submit to them, that's your responsibility, because they have a responsibility. And what's their responsibility? Submit to God by doing what? I'm sorry? Saving us, leading us, right? Right? Those are, those are all great answers. Those are all good answers. But look what he says. He says, obey your leaders, submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. So those who step up to the, to the leadership role, they're putting themselves in a position where they're now going to be accountable for you. That's a lot. That's a weighty responsibility. That's a lot of responsibility, but that's what he's telling us. The obligation of the one submitting is to recognize the obligation of the one they're submitting to. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for who? You. In other words, these are the kind of people who are going to serve anyway, they're going to do the work anyway because they're called to the work. They accepted that responsibility. But don't make them grieve. Don't give them a hard time. Don't make it difficult for them. Recognize the incredible weightiness of their responsibility that they're going to be held accountable for you and submit to their leadership. Not because they put themselves in that place of leadership. Who put them in that place of leadership? Yes, that's the key, <laughs> right? And yeah, I think that's true. Prisoners or slaves, yeah, absolutely. It's an incredible responsibility. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible responsibility. That's true. Right. Yeah, even when you become a Christian, the recipient of, a, of grace has a responsibility. We've, we kind of addressed that earlier. But, but those who, who are put into positions of leadership, um, you know, they, they have an incredible responsibility. But the point here is that, that the other group, the rest of us, have a responsibility. Okay. To the leadership model. Submission is that responsibility. Um, oh, we are out of time, aren't we? Okay. Let's skip down real quick. I want to ask a few questions before we get bombarded. Um, here's the question. Do members of the body of Christ need leadership? Absolutely. Here's number two question I want you to think about. What do you think causes a person not to submit to the local leadership? Okay. Right. 
Well, what about just the members in general? Why, why do members not submit to the leadership? What do you think? They don't like to be told what to do. You like that too? <laughs> I'm like that. I, I can relate. I mean, there's pride, there's arrogance. We don't like to be told what to do. So we don't submit because we don't like to be told what to do. Okay, last question. Boo. Boo. Last question. Often people believe that they can submit to Jesus without being part of a local congregation. What do you think about that idea? Based on what we've learned, you know, based on our submitting to the leadership and our being part of the body of Christ, all the things that Paul has talked about, often people will, they believe that they can submit to Jesus without being part of a local congregation. In other words, they want to submit to Jesus without submitting to his elders, what do you think about that model? Yeah. In general, people have a responsibility to do what to the leadership? Obey and submit, right? And so there's a sense in which if you're a Christian, then finding a body of Christ, submitting to that eldership is a responsibility. And to think that a person can say, well, I submit to Jesus but I don't want to submit to the church. I don't want to submit to the eldership. Is that the right kind of attitude? No, it's not. You see how the leadership model works? It comes from both ends. So to be a leader, you know, can be either to have a position of authority given by God to lead. It's a huge responsibility, the people of God. The other side of the leadership model comes from the submitting part, which most of us sit in that position, where we have a responsibility to submit to leadership. And that's what God wants us to do. Um, in submitting to leadership, we submit to Jesus. That's the idea. That's why he set, set that structure in place. Okay. Any questions or thoughts? Somebody's ringing the doorbell. Oh, oh no. Well, we have our doorbell sounds just like that. So well, you could have just played it off. Yeah, doorbell. It was a doorbell, folks. Okay. <laughs> any thoughts or any questions? Leadership's not always perfect, but, but they have a responsibility, and we have a responsibility towards them as well. We hate to see them fall. <laughs> yeah, that happens sometimes too. So, all right, that's what we got. Next week, we're going to be looking at Peter. Um, Peter talks a lot about leadership. That will be our final Introductory, introductory lesson, if you will, and then we're going to start digging into some characters. Um, but that's it for this evening. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful for this time that you have provided for us. We, we love to be together, Father. We love to see one another, and we just we understand that this right here, Father, is, is what we need. We need your word. We need your guidance. We need your teachings. We need to know how to be your people, Father. We know that you have gifted the church with leaders. Father, we, we understand that they are all human and they make mistakes also, but you don't. And you, sir, are the one who serves over all of us, Father. And we just understand that, that Jesus is the head of the church and we, Father, are the followers. We are his body. Help us to be submissive to that leadership. Help us to understand the role that we play. Help us to be people, Father, who strive to do your will by striving to be a unified body of Christ each and every day. Thank you for all the blessings you provided. Thank you for the grace that you have extended to us. Thank you for your son, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.